This is K2, king of mountains, 8,611 meters tall and regarded as the hardest 8,000 meter peak to climb. What I'm about to tell you is a story of human tragedy and sacrifice, a story of how decision making in the death zone is a matter of life and death. The disaster that struck K2 in the summer of 2008 was the deadliest 48 hours in its history. 25 climbers went up, 11 never returned. I was there, and I will share the horrific memories in the hope that the lessons learned will be useful to all of us, either when climbing a mountain or in navigating everyday life. You see, August 1st was a day in a million. There was no wind, no clouds, deceptively warm, and only on a perfect day is it so easy to stop questioning what can possibly go wrong. None of us were prepared for the scale of the tragedy, and it's easy to think that we're in control as long as nothing happens. After one and a half months of acclimatization, building higher and higher camps up the mountain, and outlasting two weeks of character-building storms, a favorable weather window emerged. So people from more than 10 countries got together to outline a master plan how to tackle the mountain, where every climber was like a piece on a chessboard. At first glance, you might think that our strength comes from our numbers, that is not always the case. Rather, I argue, our strength relies on communication, having a common view on risk management, and being able to make tough calls in the death zone. It was 10 o'clock in the evening when we woke up in our cramped and humid tent. We were full of anticipation and joy as we started preparing for the last stretch up to the summit. At the light from the stars, we learned that some climbers had abandoned their summit attempt and left precious safety equipment in the lower camps, such as ice crews, snow bars, and ropes. And it doesn't take a genius to understand that you need the safety equipment to climb the mountain safely. But paradoxically, even though it was missing, everyone started out climbing and two hours behind schedule. Collectively, somehow, we thought we'll solve the missing equipment problem higher up the mountain, which is a clear sign of summit fever, which is the drive or compulsion of a climber to reach the top of a mountain, no matter the cost. Eric Meyer, an American doctor, and I were at the rear end of the line this morning, and you can see us magnified on the picture. My task was to secure 800 meters of fishing lines connected to bamboo sticks that some climbers had been assigned to place on the ridge. The idea was that if we got delayed from the summit and descended in the dark, the fishing line would guide us safely back to the highest camp. Brilliant idea. But the problem? There were no bamboo sticks. Risk was rapidly increasing in climbing one of the deadliest mountains in the world. So Eric and I stopped at roughly 8,000 meters when everything sank in. There were no safety ropes. We were two hours behind schedule. Now the bamboo sticks was missing, and collectively, the climbers this night had failed as working as a team. I mean, we were immensely disappointed because this was our chance to vanquish one of the most prestigious mountains in the world, a dream of mine as long as I can remember. But Eric and I turned around and we watched how everyone else was going up. Do you think it was an easy decision to turn around when everyone else was going up? Well, I can tell you, the decision to bail was easier than deciding what to have for dinner. Because if the decision had been hard, I would have been debating about continuing and becoming an even stronger victim for summit fever. Instead, let me ask you, should it be a difficult question and decision to turn around? 
You see, how I reframe my question and put in the word should can dramatically impact my choice and decision and alter the level of risk. At the safety of the highest camp, I had a premonition. And I remember thinking, let's prepare for the worst. Then the worst started happening. Dren Mandrik, a Serbian climber, was about to pass another climber high on the mountain when he suddenly fell and started tumbling down the mountain face. He ended up on a ledge. I zoomed in with my camera from the highest camp and I saw him laying there, twitching and moving. Eric and I immediately organized a rescue mission. I headed up in haste, but it was all in vain. Dren was already dead. His friends urged me to help him bring him down the mountain to give him a proper burial. I was hesitant because we were in a trick in an exposed place on the mountain. But I was persuaded and after a meticulous safety drill, we started lowering Dren's body one step at a time. I reminded everyone, we have to let the rope go if something is wrong. It's our lives too. I underline. What happened next was horrendous. Ian Beg above me lost his footing, bounced into my back, started sliding down the mountain faster and faster. We screamed out, use your ice axe. The edge of the ridge was closing in. Ian was speeding like a projectile, unable to break his fall with his ice axe. And Then he was gone. He'd fallen into an uncharted place on the mountain, and no one could have survived a fall like that. The decision to climb down and search for GM was voted down because we lacked the safety equipment. It was late in the afternoon, we were in the death zone, and numerous climbers were still going for the summit. High above us, the climbers had reached the infamous and intimidating Sirak, an 80-meter-tall overhanging glacier regarded as Russian roulette. It can collapse at any given moment. So as crazy as it sounds, speed to circumvent the ice is essential. But what usually takes one hour to traverse under the Serac took over four excruciating hours. Eric and I were terrified at the highest camp. We tried to make contact with the climbers above, beseeching them to turn around. No one answered. It's exhausting as taken as much as one step on this altitude. Let alone speaking is a burden, thinking is arduous. The mind plays tricks on you up here. And it's likely impossible that the last people in the line at some stage could have thought they're still moving. So I guess we can continue. While the first person in the row could have thought they're still following. So I guess we can continue. It was 8.30 p.m when the last people reached the summit, and well outside the typical time for summiting, around 3 to 5 p.m. Some tried to descend in the dark, while others decided to sit and wait until the morning. Eric and I knew that our decision-making would be impaired at a high altitude. That is why we communicated with base camp, with people who were rested, had eaten, and were not colored by the situation the same way we were to guide us in our decision-making. It was decided that we should stay in the highest camp and wait for the climbers to come down and assist them. It was dark when the first piece of the Serac collapsed. The Norwegian team saw their fellow climber, Rolf Baer, lose his headlamp as it fell down the abyss. but the headlamp was resting on Rolf's head. A big chunk of the ice had hit him straight on. 
that night Shirin Dor Yesherpa found Pasawang Lama Sharpa without an ice axe under the treacherous rock, a bad place to be stranded. Shirin clipped himself into Pasang's harness, offering his help as he was the only one with an ice axe. Pasang warned, if we fall, we both die. Then Shirin responded, then we will die like brothers. Together, they started a dangerous descent into the black void, kicking their crampons into the bulletproof ice, and by a miracle made it back to the highest camp. Eric and I, so tired and beaten climbers walking into camp, we brewed tea and water for the survivors. But there were still people trapped high on the mountain who endured a hellish night in the open. Minus 30 degrees Celsius, icy winds, and the suffocating feeling of the oxygen-deprived thin air. The coming days was a blur. Everyone was working day and night. Heroic efforts were made in locating lost climbers. And by a combination of unwavering determination, regained teamwork, and partially luck, climbers could be rescued. Base camp turned into hospital, treating survivors from their frostbites. Army helicopters flew in and evacuated injured. Then everything went silent. Eleven people had lost their lives. Eric and I decided to turn around because we thought that the safety margins had been jeopardized and compromised. A decision that was respected by experienced mountaineers. But how would people have reasoned if everyone had survived on K2, but the human errors has been the same? Would we have been regarded as excessively paranoid, perhaps even quitters? I mean, must an accident happen before we can justify our decision? Or is our gut feeling enough as a rationale? There's a saying in the mountain, safe and sorry rules, because no mountain view is worth dying for. But surviving K2 was not easy. I blamed myself for not coercing the climbers to come down. I had guilt for being alive when good people have died. But despite the tragedy, we must learn and learn to move on. So what are the three lessons? One, everyone has individual decision-making responsibility. Individually, it's about deciding to turn around despite sacrifices and the realization that the group continues. Collectively, it's about no one or a few making tough decisions. Instead, the individuals and the group are driven by obsession and possibly believing that others do not harbor the same doubts. The behavior thus moves into the borderland in between two well-documented phenomena in traditional organizations. Escalating decision-making, where more time and resources are invested to justify previous investments and achieving the goal. And group thinking, where no one swims against the tide. Two, even non-decision is a decision for other individuals. The behavior is about unreflective, continue towards the goal individually and as a group. Instead of expressing your doubts, you remain silent, not because you don't dare to, but because you don't want to and or can't, while the others continue. Three, everyday decision can have far-reaching consequences. The behavior on K2 help the chain of climbers continue despite the risk of continuing. Every single step that brought the chain of climbers upwards showed that it was possible. Even such mundane decisions of putting one step in front of the other had thus consequences. We'll never hear the voices of those who lost their lives on K2 but what we can do is honor their names. Should we stop climbing after such a tragedy? 
Everyone has to make that individual decision. But me personally, I want to celebrate life. And I will continue climbing for the allure that I share for the sport. But I'll never forget the lessons. Thank you.